In our third paper this morning will be presented by Claire Cage. Claire earned her undergraduate degree in history at Dartmouth College, where she also earned membership into Phi Beta Kappa, went on to do a PhD in history at Johns Hopkins University, working with David Bell. She is in her second year now as an assistant professor at the University of South Alabama, and has just seen her second article published in the current issue of French Historical Studies, Celibacy as a Social Crime, The Politics of a Clerical Marriage. She will speak to us today on the Père de Famille and the Priest in Revolutionary France. Claire. Thank you. In 1805, Jacques-Maurice Godin, uh, a 70-year-old librarian and judge from La Rochelle, published a treatise designed to educate and advise his son. Fearing that he would not live long enough to see his seven-year-old seven son into adulthood, Godin wrote a book that followed the conventional norms of fatherly advice. But Godin's background was anything but conventional. Uh, he had married and become a father later in life. When he was in his late 50s, he renounced his vows of priestly celibacy and married his domestic servant during the terror. The Abbe Godin had been a strong advocate of clerical marriage um, long before the outbreak of the revolution and its legalization of the marriage of priests. In 1781, Godin anonymously published a lengthy treatise attacking the obligatory practice of clerical celibacy. His work insisted that marriage and the family would um, more closely tie priests, their wives, and their children to the patri. Godin asserted, the paterfamilias, who is tied to society by a multitude of bonds, is more concerned with treating its members with care and respect than the celibate, who only has concern for himself alone. Godin argued that a priest who is both a spiritual and a biological father was immeasurably more useful to society than a celibate priest. Indeed, one of the most striking aspects of the discourse on clerical celibacy in 18th century France was its emphasis on fatherhood and the figure of the bon père de famille. The campaign against clerical marriage was not simply a product of anti-clericalism. It involved fierce contestations over what it meant to be a man. Many revolutionaries answer to this question was that it meant to be a father. The meanings of fatherhood and manhood during the revolution have not con received considerably, considerable scholarly attention. Arguably the most notable treatment of the subject is Lynn Hunt's tracing of the rise of the good father uh, in the Enlightenment and his fall during the revolution. Although Hunt has emphasized the absence of the father in revolutionary political culture, I contend that the figure of the father was central and celebrated. The revolution did not do away with but rather revivified the ideal of the good father. And Jacobin politics during the terror made fatherhood a political imperative for all men, including celibate priests. There was a general sense that men who did not marry uh, um, and have children were not fully integrated into the nation, uh, but hostility toward unmarried priests was more pronounced than hostility toward ordinary bachelors. Debates about pri priestly celibacy were embroiled in heated disputes about the role of the clergy and the French church um, in society. The campaign against priestly celibacy involved exhorting and even coercing priests to marry and to become père de famille. Tied to understandings of citizenship and manhood, fatherhood became seen as an emotionally fulfilling source of personal virtue public utility and patriotism in revolutionary France. The figure of the bon père de famille became firmly entrenched in French culture long before the revolution. Enlightenment thinkers advanced a new ideal of the père de famille that celebrated paternal tenderness, affection, and sensibility while they critiqued the cold, tyrannical father of the Ancien Regime. Mid 18th century French literature, art, and culture promoted the image of the benevolent, loving father who put the happiness of his children and family first. This new paternalistic ideal uh, found expression in plays, um, novels, paintings from uh, Diderot's Père de Famille to um, Grosse's paintings of bourgeois patriarchal families and father-child relationships. The paternalistic cult of the family in 18th century France inspired literary and artistic works that attacked the unnatural or despotic father of the Ancien Regime. 
Moreover, some works condemned not only tyrannical fathers, but also any men who did not embrace fatherhood in its newly idealized form. The changing ideals of fatherhood influenced a burgeoning anti-celibacy literature that vilified all men, including priests, who did not fulfill the sacred duties of fatherhood. Anti-clericalism made priestly celibacy a more explosive issue than lay bachelorhood, and opposition to priestly celibacy intensified following the outbreak of the revolution. On November 27, 1789, three weeks after the National Assembly nationalized church properties, the Abbe Cronon, a professor of literature, presented a motion in favor of clerical marriage in the local assembly of the saint etienne uh, du mont district of Paris. He maintained that priests would be able to better counsel their parishioners um, if they had firsthand knowledge uh, as fathers and spouses of conjugal matters. And Cornell's motion helped spur lengthy, contentious debates on this issue among leading Parisian academics. A professor of theology who participated in the debates argued that marriage would transform priests into good pères de famille, who would place the interest of their children, family, and nation ahead of their own individualistic desires. The père de famille does not work for himself alone. He is unceasingly occupied with the happiness of his posterity. His entire life is often only a sacrifice that he makes for the happiness of his children. The political economist Charles uh, Marquis de Casso concurred. He argued that celibate priests were merely inhabitants of France, but as spouses and fathers, they would become citizens and would perfect the art of being useful to the paltry by raising and educating virtuous children. Such appeals for the abolition of celibacy ultimately succeeded, and the Constitution of 1791 granted uh, priests the freedom to marry. But for many revolutionaries, guaranteeing the liberty to, marriage, to marry was not enough. Um, revolutionary champions of clerical marriage increasingly emphasized the duty of priests to marry and to procreate. Revolutionary political thought identified marriage and fatherhood as a fundamental part of the process of becoming a citizen. By inspiring love of the petri, nature, and humanity, marriage and fatherhood would make priests more virtuous, better servants of the public good. Bishop Robert Thomas Lande, the first constitutional bishop to marry, maintained that the domestic virtues of a père de famille would be more useful to priests than the sterile theological knowledge that dries out their souls and closes their hearts to the sweetest sentiments that nature inspires. Linde therefore called for all priests to fulfill the duties of man, citizen, and père de famille. Emphasizing these duties, an anonymous anti-celibacy pamphlet insisted that priests, like all men, were obligated to make the most indispensable of contributions, that of giving citizens to the battery. Another pamphlet which described marriage and fatherhood as political duties and imperatives disdainfully complained of celibate priests who, who refused to fulfill the duties of man and citizen by refusing to become fathers. The lyrics of a patriotic song composed by a marriage, married priest equated fatherhood and marriage with manhood and citizenship. Um, this song raised the question, without a family, is one a citizen? Uh, the composer's response was a resounding no. He insisted that fatherhood is the foundation of the political order. Understood as a natural right and a source of Republican virtue, marriage took on new political importance during the terror, especially for priests whose refusal to marry became seen as a marker of counter-revolutionary sentiment. A Jacobin Republicans eschewed the idea that celibate priests were sacrificing marriage and family to dedicate themselves more fully uh, and selflessly to the common good and to the fellow citizens. Uh, on the one hand, celibacy constituted in their eyes a violation of the laws of nature as well as an evasion of men's civic duties to marry and to become the head of a Republican household. On the other, marriage and paternity incontrovertibly proved a priest's civic virtue and patriotism. In 1793, married constitutional bishop Tournay proclaimed, one is truly a citizen only as much as one is a husband. The state of père de famille above all completes the guarantee of his civisme. 
At the Festival of Reason in Nancy, a representative on mission urged clergymen to marry and praised married bishops and priests for having acquired in the eyes of the Republic a greater degree of civisme by becoming spouses and fathers. During the terror, members of the Jacobin Club of Perigueux asserted, for a real patriot, the only good priest is the one who binds himself to the public good by the sweetest ties of marriage and fatherhood. Married priests and bishops concurred. Uh, a married priest from Meaux declared that marriage and fatherhood were the least equivocal proofs of patriotism and republicanism. Revolutionary legislators suggested that a married priest was incapable of ancivisma. His patriotism was beyond question. Consequently, the National Convention decreed in November 1793 that once a priest married or established his intentions to marry by publishing his marriage bans, he could no longer be deported or imprisoned. Uh, conversely, some radical revolutionaries and representatives on mission uh, compelled unmarried priests to become husbands and fathers by threatening them with um, imprisonment, deportation, and even death if they did not marry or adopt a child. While some priests embraced the opportunity to become husbands and fathers, others married under duress. Uh, for those who coerced priests to marry, marriage and fatherhood represented a kind of patriotic discipline that would cultivate uh, civic virtue and would transform even suspect priests into citizens and patriots. Civic virtue and love of the patrie stemmed from virtues cultivated in the family. Raising children to be virtuous citizens was not merely the purview of Republican mothers. The father's role was crucial. Uh, Deputy Michel Adem Petit's pamphlet on national education stressed the importance of a father's role in teaching and cultivating virtue among his children in the intimacy of the household. The author declared, I must teach my son myself by daily examples to become a good father and good citizen. De Combelle, a Jacobin from Toulouse, extolled the mutually reinforcing virtues of paternal devotion and filial piety. He maintained that through filial piety, a son recognizes and appreciates paternal tenderness and sacrifice. The Maison Paternelle provides for him a school of charity and humanity. Through both paternal care and filial piety, um, he sees in the representatives of the people the fathers of the great nation to which they give laws. His heart burns with the love of the patrie. He becomes French and Republican. He will successively become a good son, a good husband, a good father, and good citizen. These Republican virtues that fathers cultivated were central to the politics of the terror. After declaring on April 2nd, 1794, that virtue was the order of the day, uh, the president of the National Convention proclaimed that true virtue was being a good father. The equation of fatherhood and Republican virtue continued to shape politics after the terror. Although revolutionary leaders abandoned coercive tactics to promote clerical marriage, the revolutionary cult of marriage and the family reached its peak in the post-Thermidorian period. The Constitution of the year three not only required that all deputies in the Council of Elders married, um, be married or widowed, um, but also proclaimed no one is a good citizen if he's not a good son, good father, good brother, good friend, and good husband. The Republican leadership of the directory inaugurated the annual festival of spouses in order to inspire unmarried men and women to marry and to become parents. The Fête des Époux was one of the clearest manifestations of the valorization of marriage as a source of social stability and Republican virtue in post-Thermidorian political culture. Although fostering marriage and fatherhood among priests was not the primary aim of these festivals, it was often a central element. At the Festival of Spouses at Angers in 1797, festival organizers and married priest Horatius Coclescu Kiel stressed that conjugal and familial love fostered patriotism and civic virtue. It is in fulfilling the duties of spouse and father that we learn to fulfill the duties of citizen. At the festival in Aix-la-Chapelle, 1799, 
Joseph, Anshu, uh, Joseph Anton Dorsch, uh, the revolutionary Catholic priest, expressed his confidence in the power of marriage and fatherhood to cultivate Republican virtue. Dorsch proclaimed, domestic virtues are the source of political and civic virtues. Consequently, he recognized only good spouses and good fathers as good citizens. The place of married priest in French society and politics changed considerably at the end of the revolutionary decade. Following the dissolution of the Constitutional Church and the enactment of the Concordat of 1801, a lengthy process of reconciliation began um, between married priest and the Roman Catholic Church. From 1801 to 1808, uh, the papal legate to France, Cardinal Caprara, oversaw the process of reintegrating priests who had married during the revolution into the Catholic Church. Roughly half of the 6,000 priests who married during the revolution uh, participated in this process of uh, reconciliation by papal petition. Only a small minority, uh, roughly 300 of the 3,000 married priests who wrote to Caprara sought to resume their pastoral activities. Uh, the cardinal required these men to separate from their <coughs> wives and children. Only 5% of married priests re-entered the priesthood. Uh, the vast majority of petitioning married priests sought to receive absolution from the Holy See, to have their marriages legitimated, and to be reintegrated into lay society. Uh, although some priests separated from their wives and children. Most priests, even those who had married under duress, refused to relinquish their new roles as, and identities as husband and father. Most petitioning priests sought to reconcile their attachment to the Catholic faith with their attachment to their spouses and children. As one petitioner observed, I tenderly treasure my wife. I have the greatest affection for my two children, one of whom is eight and the other six. The duties of nature irrevocably attach me to them, and I want to be able to reconcile this love, so sweet and natural, with the duties imposed upon me by the religion in which I was born and of which I was once a minister. In their petitions to the Pope, many married <coughs> clerics expressed their tender love for their children and their concerns with properly raising and educating them. They frequently described their relationship with their wife and children as indissoluble and resisted papal pressure to separate from them. Some expressed their reverence for the rights and duties of paternity and insisted that abandoning their children would be the greatest sin that they could commit. One father declared that breaking his indissoluble bond with his children would rip out his guts and paternal heart. <laughs> Many petitioners insisted that separation would ensure their own profound misery and that of their wives and children. One petitioner informed Caprara that tearing apart families was contrary to his faith and repugnant to the natural sentiments of a good father and good mother. Many petitioning priests affirmed their commitment to fulfilling the duties of nature as good spouses and good pale de famille. For such married priests, fatherhood represented a source of personal fulfillment and social utility. The former general vicar of Toul observed that fatherhood was his true vocation and passion. I have always thought and said I was born to be a good père de famille. Having become father of two children, I find happiness in my family. René Norbert Adam was a Trappist monk who impregnated his goddaughter while also having an affair with his, her sister, um, whom he married in 1795 and with whom he had six children. In his diary, he ruminated on the joys of fatherhood. He believed that a good father finds immeasurable happiness and pride in his children, especially in a large number of them. <laughs> a good father cares for his children's education through which they become good citizens. Adam contrasted the good father with the pernicious celibate who is like a foreigner in society. The world for him is like a vast solitude. He belongs to nothing, no tie attaching him anywhere, nothing interests him but himself, he exists for himself, he is a useless member of society. Many other married priests indicted celibacy as a drain on society and drew attention to the contributions that married priests were making to the French nation as spouses and fathers. One petitioning priest explained that one of his motives for marriage during the revolution was to be useful to the state in becoming a père de famille. 
to these married priests, fatherhood provided new meanings to their lives. Through the advent of clerical marriage during the revolution, many priests reconceived their identities. They became spouses and fathers and later confronted the decision between choosing between priesthood and fatherhood. Uh, the vast majority chose fatherhood. Uh, even priests who married as a result of coercion uh, by representatives on mission formed deep effective bonds with their children and were committed to being good fathers. The model of the bon père de famille, who was a devoted and loving father, uh, was a departure from the authoritarian father of the old regime. Uh, the figure of the bon père de famille was not only central to the discourse uh, and politics of clerical marriage during the revolution, but to French political culture as a whole. <laughs>